when we talk about highly adaptive, you know, we have a, a standing offer. In fact, in the not too distant future, we'll be having a discussion with the CIA. Uh, they're interested in food as well from a national defense perspective because there are uh, folks, without getting into any great detail, that anticipate that uh, a certain set of scenarios that come to play may shut down the world's food supply system from the supply chain standpoint. And they want to look at what's the impact if that happens. Is business resilient? Can business you know, withstand that kind of, uh, of, a, of a stress and still provide for enough food to keep large urban environments uh, healthy? And our response to that is that I think so. You know, we have, as a large corporation, we have a, an, an immense amount of adaptability. You saw that in Katrina. You know, whereas the government response was hampered by politics, was hampered by all kinds of things, Walmart was up and running the next day, and they were providing for people down there. We sent guys down there the next day. We were filling police squad cars with gas from our pumps. We gave them generators. The private sector is very nimble. Uh, they don't have that bureaucracy that holds things down. So to the extent that we have those, those capabilities within the private sector, we have the ability to do a lot of things. Now, what's the story there? Well, if we're talking about things like food deserts, uh, I suspect that you have a much greater probability of getting some of these fun things funded by working with private sector groups who are willing to help, and, and I, I, this is, that's why I want to talk to you. I think these are the kind of causes that, that responsible companies will pick up. You know, so you know, there are a lot of solutions to these things. They're not always going to come from government funding. In fact, I think as we look to the future, that's probably less and less likely. What kinds of food systems are we dealing with? You know, there were some discussions earlier about uh, you know, the, the imports from fresh vegetables, and that's certainly <coughs> true. Many of those come directly across the border from Central and South America and, and Mexico. Uh, they're simple supply chains. They, you know, pretty much you have a grower, you have some processing, and they come across the border. But are they safe? Well, if you paid attention in Germany uh, and Europe here in the last month or so, we had a pretty significant outbreak. Salmonella, those things are they're short supply chains. They are supply chains. Even in, in and I, my, we have, my wife loves to go to the dairy that's down the road and, and get raw milk. They'll squirt it in the cat's mouth and they'll should give her a, a bottle of it. And the people that I work with with the internet from, that have in, been in food science their whole lives say, are you crazy? Don't let her drink that stuff. Uh, it's bad. So they're, you know, we, we have eggs. You know, we have a, a few chickens around the house. And let me, if you want to talk about unintended consequences, we get a lot of really nice, good, wholesome eggs. Chickens are really messy. Uh, it's a, so there's a lot of downsides to doing some of these things on your own. But the direct consumables are relatively simple supply chains. That's a very small part of what we eat. Moderately processed things uh, have some kinds of international ingredients. Most of the time they don't. Uh, high fructose corn syrup, uh, corn, the, many of the products made with soy uh, are grown within a number of miles of the processing facility. The products come in, they're processed there, and they're, they're sent on to second tier processors. Uh, not particularly complex. Most of the time, there aren't a lot of international ingredients there. But when you go to the, the highly processed multiple ingredient systems, and if you look at your grocery store, no matter where, it, where that grocery store exists, whether it's a convenience store or a major chain, the majority of the food that you get would fall into that category. Those are major uh, uh, suppliers of, you know, again, the vitamins that we use, not only for uh, the things that we eat, but the things that we put in animal food so that they, you know, they, they're healthy as well, uh, come from outside the United States, areas we have absolutely no control over. You know, so that should be a, you know, we talk again about within the context of safe, healthy, adequate supplies of food. Every one of those pieces of that discussion have a very different set of issues. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I think you might want to be very interested in, in looking at is a website called the set number seven Revs, R E V S dot org. That's the, uh, the call, it's the Seven Revolutions website from the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. And they look at, uh, periodically, this uh, think tank in D.C. looks at seven conditions of the human existence over the next 20, 25 years. One of those is food and food distribution. And what they look at are, are those issues about energy, food, population growth, conflict. 
that affect all of us and the international world as we, as we get along together and survive. And they look at what the emerging threats are and what we ought to do about it. It's pretty interesting stuff. Cocoa operations. This is just an example. This is kind of the poster child for international food supplies. You know, it'll give you an idea of what they really look like. You know, these are our Coke ADM only. You know, this is just ADM specific stuff, but it's typical of the industry. The red uh, dots are processing plants. The yellow ones are buying stations. Buying stations are where these things are grown, where cocoa beans are grown. And we tend to think about uh, you know, corporate farms here and the way things are done in the United States, the way products are grown, neat rows, no weeds in them, that kind of stuff. Uh, most of, many of the products that we eat, you eat a candy bar, a uh, very large percentage of the time that, uh, can that cocoa originated in the Ivory Coast or someplace in Africa or Indonesia. This is a picture uh, outside one of the places that, that we buy cocoa from in the Ivory Coast. That's the way it's done, folks. I mean, it's a bunch of folks that uh, from a village sitting around there when the government's not completely out of control and they get killed for doing this, uh, breaking open the, the cocoa pods and separating the beans into bowls. From there, in the village, they're laid out on mats where they sun dry. And this is the same stuff that ends up in your Nestle's cocoa anywhere else. It's just, a, again, an example of how these complex supply chains go and, and how they actually work in the real world. From there, they're bagged up in burlap bags, put on ships, and transported often through government-owned ports that nobody else can get in. You can't change anything in that government port if you want to. In fact, another story there. We have some operations in India. India has a huge population and they're hungry. You know, good place, you know, from a business perspective to open business. But we're a U.S. company. We have the thing called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. We don't pay bribes, not to anybody. In order to get on the port where our product was shipped out of in India, we couldn't even get on board the place unless we paid the government guard there a facilitation fee. Now, this wasn't a, a fee that you go, you know, as a, that's a legitimate charge from the government. This is, I control this place, you give me the money or you don't get on. We can't pay that. Now, again, when we start looking at, at, at all of those issues around the provision of food, the reality belies what sometimes we would like to think. The products that ADM makes, and this is a really interesting book, my daughter loves it, she's a chocoholic. Uh, but it, it, you know, all of those things come out of there. None of those are direct consumables. You don't eat the candy bar. We provide the candy to uh, uh, just about every candy manufacturer you know, in the world, the cocoa, so that they make these different products. Uh, again, cocoa grows in un unpleasant places for the most part. Very pretty if you don't have to live there. Uh, but then it goes literally all over the world. It'll go from there on ships through Europe where it's processed, sent to the U.S. for other processing, sent to, uh, you know, and, and every one of those has warehousing, has communications, it has transportation. Our transportation division would be a Fortune 500 company on its own. You know, so, you know, they're, 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 these are massive systems that move food around the world in order to have any hope of providing safe, adequate food for the world's population, not just within deserts in our cities. Now, this is the last slide I have up here other than contact information, which I think you can get if you can get access to the PowerPoint. This is, was sent to me a couple weeks ago from a friend at Sandia National Lab. Sandia, if, you, if you're aware of the National Lab system, is, the, is a premier weapons place. These folks spend a lot of time uh, coming up with exotic weapons systems. Uh, they also pay attention to food. And this was really relevant because as we have this discussion for safe, healthy, adequate supplies of food, if you pay attention to the geopolitics of the world, what you find is that many of the, the, the intensely volatile areas of the world, when the governments fail, they fail because of food and the inadequate capabilities to provide food for that population. And what the article says, you can get a copy of it, I think, the, uh, it's a publicly available article, but the idea here is that if we do things you know, with well-intentioned uh, purposes here that raise the cost of food, even a little bit, here most of us probably wouldn't even notice if the bread price goes up 20 cents or 10 cents or 5 cents. But if you're in India, it may mean the difference between having one meal a day or two meals a day. It may mean the difference between malnutrition for your family 
or, you know, or maybe even starvation in some parts of the world. So the ability to provide efficient, safe food uh, is, is really critical to the, the safety of the world and the geopolitical stability of much of the, many of the areas of the world. So again, I mean, this is, you know, I didn't talk a lot about food deserts in specific, but in order to have any discussion about food and providing safe, healthy, adequate supplies of food, we need to make sure we think of, of that, the full world market and the full world marketplace and the issues that go around that. And again, back to what I said earlier, I believe in the necessity of communities to be able to take care of themselves. And we could talk more about that, but I think we're probably past our 20 minutes now. So I think we're gonna have time for questions. Yes, we will. Okay, thank you all.